Welcome to the Melanin Jelly Project Conversations, a podcast that celebrates diversity and representation in children's storytelling, entertainment, and edutainment. I am the host, Olunos and Luisa Ivaze. On this podcast, I chat with authors and creators of children's books, entertainment, and edutainment. This is also a collaboration with the Ottawa Black Book Club. Yeah, so thank you once again for sending these lovely books. I read them again last night and I'm like, oh. Thank you for having me. So when I read, you know when I saw the names first, Mimi, Mimao, Yaya, Gaga, Nana. Yeah, Big Mama. Big Mama and me. Yeah, I think I used to call my grandmother Mama. Mm -hmm. So my mom was this mommy and then my grandmother Mama. Okay. I, I didn't meet my maternal grandma, but my paternal grandma was strict. Yeah. She was strict. She was so Anytime I read about sweet grandmas, I'm always like, oh, God, that's how my mom is with the grandkids. That was yeah. My grandma. my grandma wasn't like that with me. My grandmother was sweet, but she she rolled well, too. And she was like a mixture of both. It's like putting salt with sugar. <laughs> but she she treated all of her grandkids like we were all the only ones. Okay. But if she had to chastise you, she yeah. chastised you. Yeah, so. my grandma was like that. At least she would tell us stories because I still have memories of you know stories that she told and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still have that mm -hmm. too. So thank you, Aislinn. You know, thank you. Uh, yeah. So go ahead, tell me about yourself and what inspired you to write these three lovely books because I had fun reading them. Yeah. So I am a um, nurse practitioner and I specialize in pediatric and adolescent medicine. Okay. Um, so I've been a nurse, oh my gosh, since 1979, because I graduated from high school as a practical nurse. And then I went on to do my registered nursing degree and then master's degree. So I've been a nurse practitioner for 22 years now. Um, and so I love kids. Like I, anything with kids, I'm all in. Um, but I have four-year-old twin grandchildren Aww. and they, they call me Mimi. And so they were the inspiration for the books because my grandson thinks I'm his best friend. So he always says, Mimi is my best friend. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. <laughs> because he thinks he should be at my house every day mm -hmm. and his Mimi should fix, can do anything in the world. So that was my inspiration for writing the books. And I try to incorporate like things I try to teach, even the kids at work, like hygiene, so brushing your teeth and eating healthy, going out to play. Um, we're riding on bike, but Mimi can fix my boo-boos when I fall um, and teach me my letters, my numbers, and we reading and we're praying. So it was like a lot of stuff I did with my grandmother. Um, she, they on the farm. So every summer we had to go help them get their crops out, but she kind of blended the two. So it was teaching you ethics and hard work but you also sat on the porch on rainy days and listened to stories about what happened in her life and why she wanted your life to be better okay. so when i look at my family you know the legacy they left us is amazing because my cousins and all of us are very successful people and they went from being meager little farmers to having a family like decades later that are judges and lawyers and doctors and nurses um, because of the what they instilled in us mm -hmm. from little to two little farmers on a farm. So that's a legacy they left us and I wanted to leave a legacy for my grandkids. So hence the books. Okay, this is interesting because this is the first book I'm reading that actually celebrates grandmothers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when you talk of black fathers and you say black fathers, they only get their flowers at their funeral. Right. That grandmothers are not celebrated enough because yeah, and they are the foundation. I feel like they're the foundation because they keep the tradition going. They keep the tradition. So it's those lessons that you learn from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, like that's how I looked at it. My my great grandmother, she lived with us for part of her life, and she was like a hundred when she passed away. But the stories of racism and prejudice that she went through, and then how how she lived her life and the things she did to pass on stuff to my grandparents, um, and then their life. It to me, it was a foundation. So I feel like we're losing that in society, yeah. and the traditions are being lost because people are being Americanized, so to speak. But they're not keeping the culture of what's important. So we're missing so much, and the kids are missing so much because they're all doing all the social media stuff instead of sticking to family traditions. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to celebrate grandmothers because I feel like grandmothers are the backbone. Um, yeah. you know, the, the grandfathers and the fathers are important, but it's the women who are the glue 
mm-hmm. and keep it together. And they're the ones who are going to nurture and chastise you if they need to. There's no in between. They're going to do what they're going to do out of love. Yeah. Very so, true. Yeah. Yeah, because even in African societies, it's mothers that actually hold families together. Exactly. Yes, they. It's the mothers. I remember uh, my grandmother. You know, would tell me stories. She would tell me stories of traditional practices. Yeah. But she held the family together. Right. She kept it going. And that's important. Yeah, she, that support was there. I know yeah. she had a garden. She had a garden. I know she had a farm. Mm-hmm. With all of that she kept the family going Mm -hmm. yes her children even though she lost kids in the process but she kept the family and i watched my mom despite everything my mom has what eight of us and while she was having us she was going to school Mm -hmm. yes she got her degree got her master's was still teaching by the time she uh, became a grandma she went back and got a phd Uh, i I think it had a good and bad side though because bad sides. women carry a, a huge burden and I think that today's younger society doesn't appreciate that. No, they don't. So, you know, that was an, another thing for the book like to try to instill in even the littlest kids like everything I learned that I need to learn in life I learned from my grandmother and so they need to I think appreciate that because when the elderly get older we need to get that back to them and I don't think that's a part of society anymore. I think now I think I think now people put parents in old people's homes. Yeah. Yes. I mean in our society where I come from, but I still go, I'm Nigerian first. You take care of your parents. Right. Now you don't put them away with strangers to my right. Yeah. So like this first book here, I'm just looking like this this one, this first one I really like. Uh, Mimi, Mama, and me. This one. Yes. Yeah, this one. That was yeah. one of all the little, little things we take for granted. You yes. Know, running a bath for you, making, you know, breakfast. My sister's uh, mother-in-law, like she, she fries eggs really well. Mm-hmm. I know my sister's son will always go. I want eggs. <laughs> and you, you know what i'm happy you mentioned that because you actually got the whole gist of the book like that was the gist of the book like we look over the small things, small things that the grandmother does that are big things to the children like here she's teaching i see her t- okay grandma is teaching um, him how to brush his teeth yeah, so i'm just looking at the little things how important do you think it is for children to read stories that celebrate where first of all they see themselves and two that celebrate family members. I think in today's society, I think it's a hundred percent important. Okay. Um, because I feel like I know when I grew up, I didn't have a lot of books that had people that look like me. Mm-hmm. And for instance, like even the Barbie dolls, I think I'm gonna be 62. I bought <laughs> I bought all the inspiring dolls that were um, African American because I only saw the Caucasian Barbie dolls when I grew up. Yep. And so I want my granddaughter to see that. Um, and I feel like it empowers them. Um, it's like where I work now, I'm the only minority provider they've had in the 42 years of practice has been open. And so the kids that are minority, when they see me, they see themselves. They see success. They see that I can do this because she's here, she's living proof it can be done. So I think that it's an amazing opportunity and a hundred percent important for them to be able to see that. Yeah. Because I'm just looking at little the other things because I write books too. I write mm-hmm. for adults and then started writing for kids. Mm-hmm. And I write my books mainly celebrate African culture. Mm-hmm. So I did uh, Crowning Glory where I was talking about um where I was talking about African hair. Oh. Yes, African hair tradition because and how it's an inspiration for a lot of of hairstyles we have around the world today. Oh, that is too cute. I yes. like that. Just, I notice people don't know about the continent. They just go, well, we went to Africa and I go, which of the countries in Africa? Africa right. has 54 countries. <laughs> and this is the Orisha or should nice. need to have been the first hairdresser. I like that. And then I like, love this. Yeah, I like that. Okay. And then the hairstyles. And then I went ahead to do like the African safari, where I was talking about indigenous African animals. Mm -hmm. Because people, a lot of people don't know that tigers and kangaroos are not indigenous to the African continent. See, uh, yeah, a lot of people do not know that. Yeah. So my last, one of the ones I have just finished writing now that I sent off, Mm -hmm. I was talking about grandma's 
cover cloth, the wrapping cloth. Nice. If I look at the African culture and I look at, because I realize that black people, despite years of separation, mm-hmm. we are very, very, we are very alike. We are very yeah. alike. Yeah. You can meet each other and notice similarities. So You're true. Because true. the body remembers. So mm-hmm. I noticed that in African American culture, there's the kilt, mm-hmm. which women, I remember back in the day, from the days of slavery, the patchwork, the, the women we sewed together and so on. Yeah. So your story just brought back these memories now. Mm-hmm. So in our culture, when you leave home, your mom gives you a piece of cloth, a, a cloth mm-hmm. which you use as a kilt, like a cover cloth when you sleep. Okay. This is it. This is what it looks like. This is it. So there are different patterns. Beautiful. Yes, there are different patterns. My mom, if you're going up to high school, if you're going to mm-hmm. boarding school, your mother will always give you a cover cloth. If you're going up to uni, your mother will give you a cover cloth. Oh, wow. mom visits us in Canada, she always comes with cover cloths. Uh-huh. Cover cloth now. When you sleep, you cover yourself with it. Mm-hmm. When you move around the house, you can tie it around. When you carry your baby, you can use this to hold the baby, tie the baby okay. back. So it's like giving you a piece of home. True. So yeah, so I did a story like that where I was talking about grandma's wrappers of love. Okay. And then if I look at the American kilt too, it takes me back to that. Back so to that. Could it be there is some sort of connection? Because when you are given that gift of a kilt to say, oh, mm-hmm. take this with you, it's like giving you a part of a part of home. And a part of your culture. Yes, yeah, a part yeah. of the culture. Yeah. So, a lot of people, when they think of grandparents, they don't think of grandparents in that sense. They just go, you know, like young people now. Yeah. My grandma is old. Now she's acting yeah. like a child. How do you think we can get children to appreciate family relationships and family members more through stories? We have to teach them that from little, like my book. So in the book, um, it has different cultures. Each page is a different nationality of grandmother. Yes, I so know. Yeah. It it'll it shows that no matter what your your nationality is or your culture is, mm-hmm. the basis is your grandmother is still an important integral part of your life. Mm-hmm. And it's those little like my grandmother, she made she used to hand make quilts. And so she made all of her grandkids a quilt. Mm-hmm. I still have mine and I'm gonna be sixty two. You see? Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it's those things and those memories that you can instill which is why i love that my grandson says my mimi is my best friend and he's only four so if he feels like that at four that means my job and the foundation is also a good start start. okay but that that comes with you being an integral part of their life and it's the little things like for him coming to my house and eating blueberries and a corn dog is the best thing ever no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the first question he asked Mimi do I still have corn dogs at your house and you have blueberries yes okay he's good to go so okay great it's the memories you make with them make with them okay so I'm going to your second book um, different than me yes different than me it's an interesting book because different than me um, is a book about kids who are one way or another become part of families that they are that are different cultures than them. Mm-hmm. And I actually wrote this book because there's a, if you look on the back, there's a picture of a, a, a granddaughter and a little girl. The little African American girl is the granddaughter of the Caucasian woman. Oh, okay. She, she her um, daughter and her husband adopted the little girl, and so their family had to blend her into that and learn how to do her hair how to incorporate her culture into the their life so she doesn't feel like I'm an African-American kid growing up in a Caucasian family without my culture. Okay. okay. And so she works at my job and she always would talk to me about the little girl and I wrote this book for her. <laughs> <laughs> to make her feel like you know and the picture the other picture of her friends so she has two different friends of different nationalities and so the book is about accepting um you know other people for who they are and seeing people for people and not a difference in their color okay um, she was adopted so at the end of the book it says i'm especially thankful for my mom my dad and my mother as i secretly pray that they bring me a brother a brother yeah because i noticed that 
she's black the other girl is asian and then the right. brother yeah uh, is, it, the, the brother is different so in this book were you celebrating adoption i'm celebrating not just adoption because some kids end up in families your foster families um but for her it was adoption yes because she was adopted and the blending of the families that there are people who see okay this child is a different nationality than me but we're gonna make them comfortable and let them live in who their culture is which i thought was a, was wonderful because they allow her to be her they they researched you know, hairstyles and different cultures, and they allow her to explore who she is, despite the fact that they're not the same culture as her. Okay, okay, yeah. I really like that about this, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What are some of the challenges you think diverse authors experience when trying to tell diverse stories? Um, i just trying to get the story across to different people. Mm-hmm. You know, like when I when I was writing the book, I have to be like, okay, who am I writing this story for? Is it just for me or is it for everyone? And there's always going to be some people who don't like it and people who do. It's kind of hard to mesh that to kind of get the, the larger part of the audience to get the message you want portrayed. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a balancing act, so to speak. But I think for me in my heart of hearts, when I put the story down, um, if I feel like it's gonna be generational and 90% of the people are gonna come away going, I learned something from this, then it was a good effort. Hmm. And how do you think we can support each other? Um, buying our books, putting the information out there for people. I always share, um, like when I get on IG, I find new books, I always share them. Um, I always am like, this is an author, you gotta get this book, I tell them why. I, even though I try to promote my books, I try to promote other people's books as well, because my books are not the only books out there. And I'm not the only um, author of color out there, and I think we all need to be able to support each other. Let me see. So I'm gonna I'm going to the Christmas. I'm going to your Christmas story. My favorite. I love Christmas is my favorite holiday. Same. So that's how I ended up with this Christmas box. <laughs> Same here. I bought a Christmas tree two years ago and decided to spray it gold. Why? I don't I don't know. <laughs> and this year I said, you know, when I set it up last year, this year I said, okay, now I'm bored with this tree. Next this year I'm gonna get the the white one, like the snow. <laughs> yeah, the snow yeah. one. I just sent up my uh, my children a children's manuscript to the illustrator, and I called an African Christmas, uh, you know, an African Christmas. Ooh. Yes, where I'm just talking about you know just what it's like to experience Christmas in an African village. Yeah, that would yeah. be. Cool. I love Christmas. Yeah, so I would love Christmas in an African village. Like yeah. it can be Christmas every day for me, and I'll be happy. It's different in back home. Christmas is different. Even the smell is different because when you come out, there's a smell of goat roasting somewhere. Oh. The smell is in the air. There's a smell of jollof rice. Everybody's house just seems to smell nice. Smell like yeah. there's chin chin, there's puff puff, all those little little things. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas is, to me, Christmas is a happy. I always used to say Christmas is magical. Yes, oh. me too. Me too. As a postgraduate student, I used to like to walk down London High Streets then, mm-hmm. just because of the lights. Yeah. Just to take, I just get, I don't know, I find myself really sentimental and emotional around yeah. that. Yeah, I, I agree. I love it. All of that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So I wrote this book, um, and it, again, is multicultural, so it has different um, nationalities of people in the book, um, and then just the fun things of what they do at Christmas. Yeah, I'm just looking at it, and... You know, because I was gonna, I was saying that I said when I talk to you today, because I usually ask authors to read one of their books, and I mm-hmm. said maybe I'll ask her to read this Christmas story. The Christmas one? Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead and read this Christmas story to us. All right. So this is Christmas with Mimi, Mima, Yaya, Gaga, Nana, Granny, Big Mama, and me. And it says, my Mimi, Mima, Yaya, Gaga, Nana, Granny, Big Mama loves Christmas, the presents, and lights. The magic of Christmas is such a delight. I love to help me, 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 my, yaya, gaga, nana, granny, big mama, to decorate the tree. My sissy says, oh, what fun it will be. She loves hanging the ornaments, the tinsel, and lights, using candy canes, ribbons, and garlands. 
That's right. With an angel on top, what a beautiful sight. We are almost complete. Yes, we're just about done. As we streak on the popcorn for so much more fun. Making gingerbread houses is a must on the list. The smell of Christmas we cannot resist. The reindeer, the snowmen, the elves, and the sights. The caroling, the tidings, goodwill through the night. Oh, Rudolph, you lead with your nose oh so bright, pulling Santa and sleigh safely through the night. He can see down below, children tucked safe in their beds with dreams of presents and toys in their heads. As Santa yells, ho, 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 through the night, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Uh -huh. This was like my favorite fun book. <laughs> it's almost, it's almost, it's almost poetic. Yeah. yeah. How important do you think it is to talk to tell children stories about different family Christmas traditions? I I actually think that um, for them it's a great learning experience, it's educational because I, I like to learn about other cultures and what they do at the different holiday times. You learn about their foods, you learn about their traditions, you learn about the things they do, and it kind of gives you an insight into your world is not this little bubble. I also think that when you, you do that with kids, it makes them want to venture out into the world and explore other stuff. Which, is, you know, if you can get their imagination working, that's like the best thing you could do for a child. They're not afraid to be, to step outside of the box. So I think I like that for them. And that for me, I, like, I was a quiet little kid. I never used, I never went outside to play. My siblings were always outside. I was always reading a book. Okay. And so always, like you could always find me in a corner reading a book. And I used to read books about Italy and the Roman Empire and all kinds of stuff. And when I was little, I was like, I want to go to these places. And I have been to Italy and Dubai. And I think that's because when I was little, I read that in the pages and I always am like, the, a book is the window to the world. So I think that's where you get them to learning and want to do adventurous stuff without fear. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's a window to the world, and it gets them to do things without fear. Yes, that child, I was a voracious reader. Yes, Nigeria was colonized by the British, so our curriculum was very British. Mm -hmm. So all the, even even our TV shows, Sesame Street. Um, no, I think Sesame Street was from the US. Yes, we had that. But, but yeah, but Sesame Street was a staple in my in my childhood, and that's how I got to know. Oh, Spanish. You know, when they would sing songs, Salida, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Spanish. Then I read all the Inid Blightons and I got to, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Other things go on in other parts of the world. But I was that child who would read a lot and I was that child who would play a lot. Yeah. Because that, oh, there are places to explore. In this exactly. Yeah. So what tips can you give an aspiring author? If, if you know, let's say... Because a lot of people listen to this podcast and they come back to me with questions. Okay. If you had an aspiring author who wanted to write similar stories that celebrates grandma, because what I like about your book is the multiculturalism here. Mm -hmm. So it could start off with an, an Indian grandma and then end with, I mean, this is a totally different, you know, right. grandma. So what tips would you give an aspiring author who wants to write these kind of stories that celebrate grandma, grandma. Read lots of children's books. <laughs> I mean, I I can't say that enough. I, I don't know why. I've always, when I was in nursing school, we had to take an elective class. I took a, a children's lit class. Um, I, and it was the most amazing class I've ever taken in my life. So much fun. So I always go, if you want to write children's books, you got to read children's books because then it gives you an idea of what's out there. So you can pick your genre. If you're gonna do it on grandmothers, get as much, go to the library, go to the children's section and read all the books that are out there on grandmothers and see what types of books are out there and see how you can fit your story and your niche into that. Because everybody, you can have somebody with the same title, but you're gonna tell a different story. Yeah, very true. Very right, true. so I read, I have tons of kids books in my house. Um, and I read a lot of children's books. 
speaking because I love them, good or bad. Like even if people I don't know are like, oh, I wrote a book, I will buy them and I read them. Some I like, some I don't, but yeah, I read them all because you never know what what will spark ideas, what you can pass on to someone else. Um, whatever your genre is, read a lot of it. Okay. So are you working on anything new? I'm working on a few new things. The Me, Me, and Me series has two more books to it that I'm going to be doing. Okay. Um, and so, and then I have another book because I'm going to be moving soon. So my grandson has this whole thing about me moving <laughs> to another state. So I think I'm going to write a book about that. Like um, Mimi is moving or something um, to write about when you have the connection with a grandmother and then when the grandmother's leaving, how their relationship is going to change and how they're going to, get through that to, for the grandmother to be like I may be leaving but I'm still here for you kind of thing okay so what was your publishing experience like because I noticed I think these books are self-published they're self-published so my publishing experience actually wasn't as traumatized as I thought it was going to be oh, but, that's, lucky you. <laughs> but yeah but that's only because my girlfriend is a publisher so she started her own publishing company called Cocoon to Wings and so when I told her that I had written the book she was like oh I'll help you so she did uh -huh. She helped me with the first book. The second book, I'm like, let me try to do it on my own. And she's like, I'll, you know, if you have questions and I was able to do it. And then the third one, I was, it was a go. It's a learning process. So, you know, I had to find my niche of um, illustrators and all that, but I've kind of gotten that down. And then when I've had questions, I just call her and go, hey, what would you do about this? Or how do you do that? So it wasn't, I was terrified, <laughs> but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Oh, lucky you. And what was your experience with your illustrator like? Um, I have two different illustrators. So the first one, it took her um, a longer time to do the book because she was trying to do two new things, two things at the same time. Okay. So it took her a while. The second illustrator, interestingly enough, I found her on Fiverr and she lives in Pakistan. Okay. And so my experience with her was amazing. Like I just sent her the, tra the transcript and I was like, this is what I need, my idea, she was sending it to me and off we went. Whenever I had to make corrections, she did it. So it was, hers was pretty seamless. The first one was a lot of back and forth and it took about six to eight months to get done. The second one, 30 days of pop, she was done. Wow, okay. Yeah. Who is that, that this one? That, that's the first one. That's the one that took like six to eight months to do. Nana Artiste is the one that only took me like a, a month or so. Like I would tell her I need this book out in 30 days and she's like, okay, and did it. So this one, what style of, did she draw this or these were AI? Yeah. It looks like the different than me when I think she did more, um, I want to call it like electronic stuff. Okay. The Christmas one she drew. Okay. More. Yeah. Okay. Now the first one she drew all of hers because I she sent them to me on like computerized stuff so I know she drew all of hers. Okay, okay. okay. So the second one she was a mixture of both drawing and like um, doing it electronically. Okay, okay. Lucky you. You are. Uh, I read about you. You're a breast cancer survivor. Yes. And you run an empowerment um, an oh, organization, oh, Duckling oh, yes. Diva. Yes, mm -hmm. please talk to us about that. So, Dublin to Diva, oh my gosh, I think I started that in 2008. Um, it's a young women's empowerment organization where when I started out, I started doing it at my old church. And so we had girls from, I think I started at eight, from eight to 18. And so we started out with classes on little girls for puberty um, and then finances. So we had puberty, finances, self-esteem, and then typical like things they needed to know in life and we always had the the inner circle of things we needed to talk about so we would have those classes and i always taught the classes to the the moms as well so we used to do a mother daughter retreat okay. so whatever the girls were taught the moms were taught so they can continue to teach that to them at home mm -hmm. so it was it was really empowering them because i i feel like women make relationship decisions based on what they're lacking in life and that usually is looking for someone to love them. Yeah. But if you can teach them early on in life to love themselves, they make way better decisions because the first person you're going to love is you. And if whatever somebody else is trying to impart on you does not uphold you or empower you, the decision you make for your life is always a positive one most times. Okay. Um, but when they're missing that, um, 
they, you know, you fall into the pitfalls of, oh, well, I'm trying to get a man to love me, or you're trying to look for love from somebody else. And then the other part of that is to teach them life skills to take care of themselves. So yes, you may have married this man in your 20s that you thought you loved, but at 40, you're like, this is not working for me, but I have no money to care for myself. I have no education. So teaching them how about finances, how to manage your money, how to save your money and live life good. So when things happen to you in life, you might not be happy about it, but it doesn't devastate you. Okay. Um, and then just the whole relationship of kindred um, spirits and women. Like, I, I feel like women need to be able to support each other, which doesn't mean you tell everybody your personal business, but you got to have a friend circle that you have people you can lean on when you need to. Yeah. So it's that whole empowerment thing of um, women supporting women, but making sure you can support yourself as well. Okay. Well, that's that, that's be- that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. And um, so, what would you like to see for your books? I would like for my books to be able to. I, I had the, I saw this saying and I love it. It says, "From from zero to three, kids are learning to read, mm-hmm. and from three and up, they are reading to learn." And so, I want them to be able to learn to read and read to learn, but also learn cultures traditions and just treating people like basic human beings because I think that's why this world is where it is right now. If we stop looking at people um, I guess in a color way and accept everybody's culture we could all learn something about somebody that you might actually love and we may live in a much more peaceful world. Um, that It doesn't mean that we're not going to have people that have evil thoughts or whatever they want but I think if the books can start the foundation of loving our own families and then that spreads to other families, that we'll be in a much better place than we are right now. That makes, yeah. That's... And help kids dream. I mean, like I said, I think that reading is the window to the world. So if you have this great feeling when you read the book and it makes you feel good about who you are, and then in turn you help somebody else feel good about who they are, it's like paying it forward. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's very true. I think for me, when I look at your books, I'm still I'm still grateful that this is the first book I have come across that celebrates. I mean, I've read books that celebrate family relationships. I've read okay, Granddad and Me. Yeah. That's the Are you gonna do Grandma and Me? So now I'm happy that actually I've come across this book that celebrates uh, grand grandmothers. I mean, even though my grandma was very strict, but <laughs> yeah. But now putting myself in her shoes, maybe I would have done worse. Yeah, because I was talking to someone the other day and she was saying, oh, when she was growing up, her mom was so mean to her. Her mom was this. And I said to her, I've learned to be very forgiving of parents because nobody has the manual on the perfect parenting. Exactly. And one thing a lot of, one thing we should realize is that time is something we don't have. You spend, yes, time is something we don't have. You spend, what, 20, 40 years angry at your mom because, oh, she made, she said this, she said that. Right. You don't have time, you don't, you don't make out time to let go and make up. Right. Yeah, there is no perfect manual on the perfect parenting. And I said to her, one day when you become a mother, maybe you will understand. You will understand. But just pray that you become a mother when you still have your mom. All right. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. Yes, yes. And I mean, I had to learn, because I didn't have the best relationship with my mother, but I had to learn that I don't know what she was equipped with or what she wasn't equipped with. So my aunt has said to me one day, she did the best she could with what she had. Yes. And that kind of stuck with me because I was like, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. They knew, like someone was saying to me that uh, one time we are just talking about relationships and she was saying, oh, I wish our mothers had advised us better on how to choose better partners and all of that and i said to her have you ever thought that our mothers didn't know any better and still don't know any better right yeah because right. a lot of things our fathers did to them we won't tolerate today exactly but think about it they didn't know any better they were raised and then some of them didn't have a choice and they didn't have a choice right so i think we should learn to be more forgiving and learn to move on and let go because yeah. like Africans, as Africans Africans will say a lot of people have the energy to dwell on things because they don't have more serious things to think about <laughs> if people want to buy your books where can they find your books to buy 
They are all, all on Amazon. Okay. All three of them. On Amazon, if you put in my name, Iceland Hamilton Austin, they all pop up. Okay. And um, what are your social media handles? <laughs> my, I'm on Facebook under Iceland Hamilton Austin. Okay. Instagram as Iceland 51. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so, so much for making our Thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful time spent with you. I <laughs> love talking and meeting you. <laughs> Same Great thing. time. Yeah, me wonderful. too. And um, good luck you. with the rest of your podcast. All right. Thank you so okay. much. Have a, love Have a good you. evening. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>